Alpha Girls, don't you love that title? Award-winning journalist Julian Guthrie is here tonight who's going to share some unforgettable stories of women who through grit and ingenuity have been a part of creating remarkable stories here in Silicon Valley uh, in the world through venture capital as investors. Joining her will be uh, Sonia uh, Joel Perkins and also uh, venture capitalist and alpha girl along with seasoned executive um, Abe Kleinfeld to share their experiences as a male-female power duo and the companies that they've created which have had million dollar exits and been <coughs> award winning for innovation as well as uh, customer uh, satisfaction. And we had to have the ideal moderator and none other than our own CHM trustee as well as uh, Tesla early investor Lori Yoler. So an amazing lineup, and I'd like to introduce each of them now as there's a tradition using five numbers. Let's start with author Julian Guthrie. 20, the number year of years as a daily journalist of the San Francisco Chronicle. 2,080, the approximate number of news stories written. Five, the number of times uh, nominated for the Pulitzer Prize. Four, the best-selling uh, books in eight years and 13, the age her son turns in July. Please join me in welcoming Julian. So glad to have you here. Thank you. Next, Abe Kleinfeld. 40, the number of years in the technology industry. Two, number of IPOs. Three, M&A exits. 1965, the year he immigrated to the United States from Guatemala. Infinity, the things he still wants to learn. Join me in welcoming <laughs> Abe to the stage. Now, Sonia Hoel Perkins. 30, the number of years as a venture capitalist. 52, the number of Broadway angels. 500,000 women and girls served by her project Glimmer. Six IPOs. 50, the percentage of CEOs backed for a female. Join me in giving a very warm welcome to Sonia. <laughs> and finally, our moderator, Laura Yeller. Six, the number of companies where she was part of the founding team. 1987, the year she started writing AI code. 10, the number of years at Tesla as a board member and board advisor. 20, the number of boards Lori served on, including the museum here. And last but not least, five, the number of universities intended. Join me in welcoming Lori to the stage. So welcome, it is fabulous to see this incredible uh, audience and showing, and I'm really honored to get to moderate this evening. And I have to tell you, I absolutely love this book. I can't believe how much I loved it and uh, was uh, reading every story and savoring every word in the book. And so for any of you who have not picked it up yet, I hope you buy copies for all of your friends because it's a tremendous story of empowerment. So I'm very excited to get to be here tonight to talk about it. So I wanted to start out uh, with Julian and uh, you know, my uh, starting with her, I think it was almost a year ago that you called me to tell me you were starting this project and I thought it sounded so interesting. So please tell us. I think us, it was a couple years ago. Was it a couple years ago? Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> so tell me how this book came to be and why you, why you took on this project. So I was touring for my last book, which was called How to Make a Spaceship, and it was about the private race to space. And I was uh, with a fellow named Peter Diamandis, who founded the X Prize. And there were so many entrepreneurs and engineers and uh, rocket uh, aerospace folks in the room, and there would be a room like this, and I would look out, and out of 1,000 people or 500 people, I would see you know, five to 10 women. And I thought, this is such a these are such dynamic industries. 
I asked, where are all the women? And I was not oblivious to this, having been a reporter for 20 years, but it really struck me that these are such incredible industries where women are so underrepresented. So I started looking at tech, and then I kind of winnowed it down further to look at venture capital as a really interesting field that um, has a lot of impact in the world in kind of shaping how we all live. And I started with the statistic that 94% of all investing partners are men or were men when I started my reporting. But then I thought, well, that means that 6% are women. And who are the women and how did they do it? So I started by casting a wide net and finding out who was there and interviewing. I interviewed the founding fathers of venture capital because they're all men, uh, but wonderful ones like Arthur Rock and, and Bill Draper and Pitch Johnson. And, and uh, then I started finding the women. And I really was struck by the success stories that I found. But I wanted to tell a story that wasn't just about their professional lives, like how did they do the deals, how did they win the deals, what was it like, what did the world look like to them being the only woman at the table, the only woman in the room, but I also wanted to weave together the stories, their personal stories. What happens when you know, they start adding on as we do with partners, with husbands, with children, with aging parents. Um, so that was kind of how I got into this whole, this whole wonderful adventure and met you, <laughs> one of the alpha girls. And I was struck by, by Lori's story, too. I mean, just, you know, there, were, there are these success stories that are there. And it was just a matter of finding them. And uh, Sonia was also a, uh, a key alpha girl featured throughout the book. And uh, one of the things that I really loved learning about Sonia, first of all, that she loved the Grateful Dead growing up, which I never would have guessed. <laughs> <laughs> and secondly, that she had all these sayings throughout the book, some of them Buddhist poems and other sayings that she had. And, and uh, I have the privilege with a number of the women here in investing with her in Broadway Angels and one of the sayings that she has always reiterated in that setting is, we, we win, not whine. And so she was always someone who kept a really positive attitude. And I loved so many of the quotes from the book. Um, in fact, in the Buddhist prayer, may obstacles not impede us, but arise as allies, was one of my favorite quotes. And she actually wrote The Girl's Guide to Winning. <clears throat> as part of this, which she shares with entrepreneurs. So, uh, but I know that uh, you and Abe have worked together on many occasions, Sonia. So tell us about how you, the two of you first started working together. And I think you hired Abe into uh, at least one of those companies. So tell me about how that relationship started. And I'm also thrilled that Abe is here representing uh, an alpha guy, or a... <laughs> so. I'm, tonight I'm an alpha girl. OK, so. good. <laughs> Honorary alpha girl, Abe. So tell us about that relationship between the two of you. Yeah, so um, one of my first investments that I made when I was at Menlo Ventures was in a company called Eloquent, which was a service company that basically would help large corporations uh, save their sales training and their big presentations that they had. It required taking slides and videos, and it was a, a big service uh, company, but it also had technologies. And it was a very, very big market. We had an unbelievable customer list. Um, but we had a problem. Um, we needed a CEO. We had a, a founder who was terrific, uh, who, who was uh, deciding to become the chairman, and we needed to find a CEO. And we also had some problems. Uh, some of the salespeople weren't getting along with the marketing people, and there was a bit of some cultural issues, which I'm sure many of you have experienced in companies. And um, we were behind plan. We had a very low gross margin because our services were not being used at the rate that we were hiring people to fill them. And we really needed to fix the company. And um, so we had two candidates. We had a female candidate who looked very good on paper, and she was going to be really good at solving um, uh, a lot of the, the cultural issues that we had with the company. 
Uh, and then we had Abe, who uh, had sales and marketing experience. Um, he had he'd never been a CEO before, and um, you know they were just very different, seasoned you know CEO versus Abe, first time potential CEO with a sales and marketing background. And there was huge contention on the board about which one we should hire. And I actually wanted to hire Abe, and, and the chairman wasn't so sure, and it was just kind of a mess. And, and so finally, I told the, the board, I said, we have two companies here. We have a six-year company, and we have a six-month company. So the six-year company, the, the woman CEO, the seasoned CEO would have been perfect, right? But for the six for the six-year company, but for the six-month company, we had to go out and we needed some sales, we needed some revenue, we didn't really need to worry so much about the culture because in six months, if we were out of cash, it was gonna be over. And it actually swayed the chairman and we hired Abe as the CEO. And as we all know, Abe did an outstanding job, and I'm sorry that I got you into that mess in the beginning, but um, <laughs> I apologize. But he took the company public, and uh, we've been working together ever since then, and I think that was 21 years ago. Wow. That's amazing. Yeah. That's amazing. Feels so like Abe, week. Oh. <laughs> Abe, what was it like having a female investor and board member? Uh, especially bringing you in, uh, and what did Sonia bring to the table as an investor and board member that you maybe hadn't experienced before? Well, Sonia and I hit it off very quickly when, when, I, when I first met her and when I was interviewing for the job. And the funny thing is I wasn't even really, when I found out about that job, it wasn't, I wasn't interviewing for the CEO job. I was interviewing for the VP of marketing job, <laughs> which was also open. And I remember uh, having a conversation with one of the board members. I don't remember which one it was. And I said, you know, I was coming off of a big IPO, open text, uh, that had done very, very well. I was one of the founders of that company. And the, um, I remember saying to the board member that, you know, this company is so small, eloquent, that I probably shouldn't be the VP of marketing. I should probably be the CEO. <laughs> and that's how I ended up interviewing for the CEO job. Um, but I remember meeting Sonia. We were at a restaurant. Um, somewhere on Presidio, under Presidio okay. back then. And, I, and we hit it off right away, and I, was a, I became a huge fan of Sonia, and she was a big supporter of mine. So it was almost instant. I remember just liking her from the very, very start. I never once thought about, I really never even considered that she was a woman. We actually had two women uh, investors. I don't, you know, many of you, if you've been around the Valley for a long, long time, might remember Catherine Gould mm -hmm. from Foundation Capital. So Catherine Gould and Sonia were both investors in the company. Um, and to me, it was my first CEO job. What did I know? You know I don't know, you know whether it's a woman or a man. I was just happy to be there. Um, and so, but we hit it off right away. She was always a big supporter of mine. Things didn't always go well there, uh, but she always supported me. And then she, um, she hired me again later at, uh, at Encircle, 10 years later. Incredible. Yeah. And Julian, tell me, uh, you interviewed a lot of the early male figures in venture capital, and you also chose the alpha girls that you chose. Tell me what, first of all, how you chose some of the other alpha girls for the book, and what you found when you were doing these interviews with a lot of the male CEOs and early venture capitalists. So there are things that you uncovered. Is this relationship unique, or did you find other kinds of relationships uh, that you uncovered as part of those stories? I found with, with Sonia in particular, although this was the case actually with all of the women who succeeded, of course, because they have to succeed with the guys. They have to find ways to make it work, to become a part of the team. Um, so there were commonalities between the women, the primary figures of Alpha Girls, and we can talk about that. But you asked how I found, how I settled in on these four main characters. And they are definitely characters, they're real people, <laughs> but um, as a journalist, as a writer, I call them characters. And that is, so first I wanted women who had different backgrounds and who came to Silicon Valley with maybe a shared dream and they arrived on this canvas at different times, different years, uh, from different perspectives, and, but arrived here and had a shared dream of making it in this world that 
is seemingly inhospitable to women or is very difficult for women. And so what did they do when they arrived here, whether by, you know, beat up Ford Pinto or um, whether it was, you know, whatever the background is that brought them here. So how did they succeed? I was really interested in that. I was interested in their stories of what was irrefutably theirs. What did they do in terms of they took the lead on a particular company. Maybe that company galvanizes an industry. Um, so again, these deals that were irrefutably theirs, where they took the lead, where they you know, were the first in, where they were mentoring, um, and there was great longevity there. Different investment methodologies, uh, very different personalities. I think that the pieces, the individual women, and yourself included, Lori, I think that you see these different images of these women with their backstories, with their hopes and dreams, um, very, very different. But together, it presents a really interesting whole. And there are these themes that emerge and these, you know, about how women can succeed. What did they have to do? What did they do that they had in common? Um, and there are commonalities. And there was, one was, um, you, you referenced earlier um, when we were talking, humor, the use of humor to diffuse a tense situation. So there are a lot of things like that where they really successfully figured out how to be one of, not necessarily one of the guys, but an insider. So maybe they started out as outsiders, but they found their way in very strategically, very successfully. Um, and their stories hadn't been told largely had not been told. So everything about this story was a revelation to me, I must say. Um, you know, I mean, even you think of the story of Tesla and you think of Elon Musk. And there's a, there's a whole story about Tesla that comes pre-Elon. And Lori was really key to that. And it's a story that too few people know. Um, and that I was really interested in, and I think the world should be interested in. And there are so many stories like this where women played a key role, and that role was not known. But they are there, and their success stories are there. So I'm going to turn this on you. So talk about the early days of founding Tesla in 2002, right when the idea came to you. I think that's a fascinating story. So I, I was working with Martin Eberhard and Mark Tarpening at a, a networking company, actually. We were developing 10, 10 gig networking cards. And one day, Martin came to us and said, hey, I need a new car. Um, I'm going to go out and shop for a car, and I want a really snazzy, high performance car. And I said, OK, you know, whatever. I had small children. I was not looking for a high performance car. <laughs> um, and so. Uh, he, uh, he came back and he said, hey, I've been test driving all these high-end cars like Lamborghinis and, and Porsches and, and Ferraris. And he said, have you looked at the gas mileage? And I thought, I really don't have time to look at gas mileage of sports cars, but no, tell me, you know. And he said, it's terrible. Don't you think there are people that would care about uh, fossil fuels and usage of, of oil? that would also want to drive a sports car. And I said, sure, yeah. And uh, there was another gentleman we were working with named Steve Kasner who had leased an EV1. And so during lunch, he would often give us rides to our lunch locations. And so I got to experience one of the early electric vehicles. And I thought it was so cool that you just hit the, hit the, uh, the gas pedal and uh, the torque was amazing. And so I fell in love with the EV1 and so when Martin started talking about building this car company. I, I went online and I looked at what had happened at EV1 and how they had been crushed and there had been all these customers who really, really wanted one. And so I came back to him and I said, wow, there seems to be a really interesting market. And so he and Mark, uh, Mark Tarping, a tremendous software engineer, uh, went together and said, hey, we're going we're gonna to go out of this networking thing and start this company. Do you want to come with us? And at the time, I said, I kind of got to really need to finish what I'm doing in this other company. But 
if you uh, come up with a good business plan, I'll be your first investor and board member. And so that was how that came about. And I got to work with them very closely in those early years. In fact, was there almost every day and got to talk to every early customer and, and uh, try very hard to raise a lot of money for the company even back then when uh, the venture capital community was not at all interested in funding a car company. I'm not sure if it's much more open now, but they were certainly <laughs> very, not interested at all in uh, 2003, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So uh, it was tough going, but an incredible experience. And, and going from, so you being there from IDEA until 2005? Till, till, well, I was on the board until um, 2008, 2008, and then I became an advisor to the company because fortunately some large investors did come in in 2008. Uh, Toyota and Daimler both invested in the company and uh, wanted, wanted board seats, and I was absolutely happy to have uh, board members who had far more automotive experience than I did uh, join the board at that point and invest in the company. So I became an advisor to the company for the, for the next five years. Well, this reminds me of one of the alpha girls is Magdalena Yashiel. And she was there from IDEA through IPO of a little company called Salesforce. And you know, helped uh, helped Mark Benioff from the get-go build that company up and salvaged it, rescued it in the dot-com bust, and played a really, really key role. So that's what I love about this dialogue and this story is is there are these really extraordinary women who played a very significant role, like you described with Tesla, getting that going. And I love, I know when you were writing the book, you talked about the hidden figures of Silicon Valley and the hidden figures in venture capital whose stories often haven't been told. So I think it was fabulous that you took that on. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, so Sonia, you have backed other amazing male entrepreneurs in addition to Abe. And it seems like you have been terrific at fostering long-term relationships with these entrepreneurs and serving on their boards. And sometimes, as you said, some of the conversations are less than pleasant and more difficult. So what is the key? How did you uh, foster these long-term relationships with quite a variety of male CEOs at some tremendous companies? Oh, I have all, all kinds of tricks. But um, the first one is. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to write this down. Okay. <laughs> you know these. You know these uh, the first one is I'm really clear with what I expect from the CEO from the beginning. And Abe is very familiar with this, where I tell them that you know, they need to meet the number. It doesn't matter what the number is as long as you gave it to me. And that's cash and revenues and bookings and whatever the numbers are. But they're numbers that come from the, the team. So you have to meet the numbers. You have to hire well. Um, because sometimes the CEOs will say, well, you know, we missed sales again this quarter, but you know, that salesperson I hired is terrible, right? But, but that's, it's, the, it's the CEO's job to hire the team. It's not the, the, the VP of sales job if it's, if it's, if it's the wrong person. Um, and then you have to have happy customers. Just make sure your customers are happy. That means the product works. It means um, you're not getting over called with customer support calls. It means that, you know, this, that people are buying the product. And with those three simple things, you don't have to micromanage your CEOs. Like, I don't think I ever totally micromanaged you. Um, but, you know, the, the, the tools that you have, you know, and, and so they just know exactly if they're, if, they're meeting, if they're meeting their goals or not. You know, did they hire well? Do they have their mini, are they making the numbers? And then um, are they uh, having happy customers? Um, and then with all that said, I would say every single company always misses their numbers, pretty much every time. So if you fired your CEO every time they missed the number, we would have no CEOs in Silicon Valley <laughs> at all. Um, and so, so when you have that situation, which, which happened a few times, Abe, um, where we missed the numbers, you have to ask the question, like, you, you try to determine, you know, what's the problem, right? Is it a market problem? You know, if we have a market problem and we miss our numbers, there's absolutely no way you can fix a market problem. It means there's nobody that wants to buy your product no matter how great it is. Okay, is it a technology problem? Does that mean that the product, does it work, does it not work? And if it doesn't work or if it doesn't have the right interface or the right features, you can easily fix a technology problem. You just add more technology, right? 
And then the third question is, is a hard one, is, is an implementation problem. Are we not executing? Do we not have the right team? And is it the CEO that we need to change? Or is it the VP of sales? Or is it the VP of marketing? Or do we need to add a business development person? But when you ask those three questions, and you, you, and you get to the point where, hey, I really do believe in this market, and I actually do believe in the product, and yeah, you know, the sales are off a little bit, and implementation isn't that bad. You can just move forward, right? But when you ask those questions, again, it's just very, very straightforward. And then there are times, um, this is the worst situation, when it actually doesn't work, where you don't have, you don't have a market. Or if you have a market, there's 17 competitors that are ahead of you, and there's just no way you're going to win. And that means you either have to sell the company or shut it down. And, and that's a very, very hard decision. Um, but when it's made, I, I see a lot of VCs, they don't do this, and I don't understand why. Um, they forget that they're not investors anymore. Because when a company is not working, you are going to lose some or all or, you know, of your money, right? You're not, it's not going to be in the win column, so it's still going to be a loss. And that's... You know, that's kind of the reality. And a lot of the VCs that I've worked with, they get super angry when this happens. And they say, well, if I'm not making any money, then you're not making any money. And it's just the total wrong way of thinking. What you should be thinking when a company needs to get sold or, get, or, or be shut down is, how do I save the jobs? And how do I save the customers? Because you know, with the startup ecosystem, you need to save jobs and you need to save customers. So people will want to buy from startups and will also want to, you know, work for startups and also want to work with you again because just because you didn't have a market for a company it doesn't mean they're a bad person and it doesn't mean they're not going to have a good idea later and so I think that has been kind of my secret sauce in this venture industry and working with all men because I've uh, almost all men but I've really treated people fairly and they've really known what was required to win. So Abe, clearly Sonia does not have any uh, strong opinions that she would ever share with anyone. So I'm, I'm curious. Yeah, I've never heard any of this before. <laughs> so I've, uh, yeah. It's all about the setup. <laughs> so um, how, why has your relationship prospered over the long term? Tell us some of the lessons that you have learned from her. And especially now, there's a lot of question. I even saw things in the press this morning saying a lot of men are uncomfortable working one-on-one -on -one closely with women because they're not sure how to behave. So tell tell us how that uh, yeah. tell us how you've had no problem doing this, uh, especially for the long term. Well, first of all, Sonia has to me, Sonia was always so easy to work with uh, because she was so upfront. It turns out that out of all my board members and all my investors, she was the only one that ever came out and actually said these kind of things. Everybody else said nothing. And so you're on your own, and you really don't know kind of what people expect, especially as a first-time CEO. I remember, you know, you're basically doing it on your own, and you're, you're scrapping for everything that you can possibly get. And with Sonia, you always knew where you stood. You always knew what was important. You always knew what you needed to do. And that was very helpful. And I always appreciated that about Sonia. So she was, the other thing about, about working with Sonia that I always found awesome was that she's very positive. I mean, when I read the book, um, I, I learned a lot about Sonia. You know, she had struggled, she had, you know, there was a lot of, and I didn't know about most of it because I, I was never exposed to it. When I, whenever I dealt with Sonia, she was always positive. She was always forward thinking. She was always helpful. She was more worried about me and my company than you know, talking about her own life. So I, I always found her to be awesome to work with. And I never really, I, it never, maybe because I have a very strong wife and I had a very strong mother that I'm used to working with powerful women. Uh, but I never had a problem with Sonia being a woman. I never even considered, I never really thought about it, to be honest with you. And, and we always, I've always had boards where Sonia was on two of them. That was almost all men. In fact, she was the only woman in my last company uh, for about 10 years. And there was no question who was in charge. <laughs> there was no question who was in charge. It was always Sonia. <laughs> Julian, in uh, part of the book, uh, I can't remember if it was the, the end or in the summary, you said that it was excruciatingly difficult to get the women in the book to be candid about their failings and vulnerabilities. Why do you think that was? And tell us about uh, how you got these women to open up and tell their stories and how you decided which parts of their stories to tell. 
So um, it was. That was the most difficult part of the book, actually. And I've interviewed some of these titans of industry men, uh, from Larry Ellison to Elon to uh, Peter Diamandis and Richard Branson and others. And it seems as though when I would ask them about, as I reflected on this, that when I would ask them about their shortcomings or failings or vulnerabilities, that they could talk for hours about them because <laughs> it kind of rounds men out, softens men in a way, makes them whole. But for women in the industry who, uh, again, were the onlys for the most part, uh, were the minority, they needed to be very strong. They needed to be um, unflappable. They needed, in a way, to wear that Teflon suit. And so to ask them, what are your regrets? When were you hurt? What did you, when did you make mistakes? Uh, what were your failings? When did you fall down? Um, what were the low points in this journey? Because I got the high points. I got the successes. I got Teresa Gao chasing down you know, Facebook and Trulia and Imperva and Forescout, and I got Magdalena, you know, telling this story of her career as a serial entrepreneur and backing Salesforce and all of these things. And I got Sonia with her amazing stories with Acme Packet and F5 and Priority Call Management and uh, MJ Elmore, uh, you know, one of the first women uh, in, you know, in the U.S. to make partner at a venture firm, you know, partnering with Reed Dennis. So I got their success stories. But again, the hardships, the vulnerabilities, what happens when you are ill? What happens when you have children uh, and you come back to your, your all-male office? How do you handle these things? You know, again, what were the mistakes? How do you juggle all that women juggle? You know, what do you, what drops? What, what mistakes do you make? So that was very difficult, and Sonia can attest to that, that we had a lot of back and forth. And I felt so, um, I was so sure that this was really important to the story. And I'm not, I wasn't seeking scandal. I just wanted to tell a story that reflected the complexity of these women's lives. And also that people can relate to and they can see, you know, Sonia had these struggles, uh, Teresa had these, Magdalena had these, MJ had these. You know, we all have these challenges. So that was, that was very difficult and I just, uh, I persisted. <laughs> and uh, no rarely means no. I just find a different way around it. Sonia is nodding her head. Uh, but Obstacles I feel... don't imp impede us, but they arise as allies. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. So I'm proud, of, I'm proud of the story in its entirety. But in general, venture capitalists and entrepreneurs are very optimistic. I mean, we are, you'd have, you have to be optimistic because every single company is going out of business. It's going to run out of cash, right? They all need cash, and right? You couldn't get out of bed if you, were op if you weren't optimistic. And so I think it's just the, the natural personality of, of alpha girls and alpha guys too, just because we're looking for the positive at all times. And I noticed a lot of discussion of optimism versus pessimism in the book. Do you think that to be an entrepreneur, you have to be incredibly optimistic. And when does, where's the balance with realistic and optimistic? How do you, how do you look at that, Abe? There's not much of a balance. I mean, you have to be optimistic. Yeah. The reality is that, you know, especially in Silicon Valley where you have a lot of startups, um, and startups, we talk about startups as being, you know, 100, 200 people companies, but there's a lot of like 10 people companies that are really true startups. And you have everything going against you. And the reality is that you're, if you really stop to think, you're going to fail. You cannot <laughs> stop to think. You have to be positive. You can't look backward. You have to look forward. Everything about what you do has to be extremely positive and optimistic mm -hmm. to a fault, to a fault. So you can't be balanced. <laughs> not and in, not in be a CEO of an early stage company in Silicon Valley. You have to be unbalanced. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. 
That's great. <laughs> OK. Um, so uh, with all of that optimism, um, Abe, why do you think there are so few women on boards and as venture capitalists out there? We're all very optimistic that it will change. Why do you think uh, it hasn't changed yet? You know, I, I, there was, um, when I was at Open Text, one of my board members there um, said something to me that always stuck with me. It was about products, building products. And he said, there's two, there's two ways to look at products. One is you build something that requires a behavioral change, and you're probably going to be successful. But when you try to build something that requires a cultural change, you're going to be unsuccessful because it takes generations to change cultures. And I think that that's really true in, in this case. I think we're dealing with um, a culture that has accepted male dominance for ever and ever and ever. We're dealing with, um, with other cultures in Silicon Valley, um, you know, we, different genders, different cultures, different, that have that problem in even bigger space, you know, to a larger degree. It takes a long time to change a culture. Uh, it takes generations to change a culture. And I think that it's just difficult. If you have a bunch of guys who are running something and they say, and I see this in my company, you know, a bunch of engineers get together and they say, we're only going to hire A players. Well, their definition of A players are people like themselves, right? So guys will hire guys. Um, women will hire women. You know, Indians will hire Indians. Chinese will hire Chinese. This is why you see companies. Affinity bias. Yeah, you bias. have this yes. tremendous Jeffrey bias. Jeffrey written about and, it. Yeah. And to think that you can just change that behavior when they go home at night and it's built into their family structure, it's built into, so, so it takes a long time for cultures to change. But it has to start somewhere. And, it, and uh, you know, I had this conversation with Sonia about, I don't know, th two or three years ago. And I have a very, my company does in-memory computing. It's a very technical software infrastructure, deep thing. Um, and it's all guys, right? So it's, you know, it's, you know, even trying to interview women is hard. You know, you can't even get them in the door. And I remember having this conversation with Sonia. I said, you know, it's just really hard to hire women. And she said, no, all you have to do is hire one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And... <laughs> And she was completely right. We went from being like an all-male culture. We hired one woman, and all of a sudden we could hire more women. And, it's, and it is so true. So it's, cultural change is hard, but you have to start with behavioral change. And I think if you just get started, things start to happen. That's a great piece of advice. But you know, related to that, you can't be what you can't see. And you know, 10 years ago, I kept hearing there are no women in tech, there are no women in venture capital. The, it was just, there were none of us. And, and I thought, well, of course there are women in venture capital. I, I know quite a few of them. And so we decided to start Broadway Angels so we could have a group of women together that were very successful, that could invest together. And also we now have entrepreneurs who also are investors. So we have a visible place where people can see women who are actually doing things like funding and founding Tesla and you know, f funding and founding Salesforce, and they can try to become like them. And I think, I think the whole idea of having positive role models, which is why I'm so glad Jillian wrote this book, because it is probably the most mainstream I think I've ever been. <laughs> and, <laughs> and now, you know, hopefully thousands and thousands of people will read books about real women who actually accomplished quite a bit. Um, life isn't always as easy as it looks, as the book will, will share with you. And, um, and when women and girls read this book, they'll want to become us. And that's what we want. And we want everyone to want to get into tech and to get into venture capital, because those are the best jobs. They pay the most. They are legacy creating jobs. So the companies that we fund can change the lives of every man, woman, and child. And so that's why we, as women, should want these jobs. Fabulous. So, uh, <laughs> Julian, tell us some of your favorite stories from the book and some of the lessons that you learned on how women have succeeded uh, in, in this, uh, as, you were, as you were going through these stories. 
Um, so a few. There are obviously it's you know picking your favorite child, but um, <laughs> I love how the book opens, and I reference that. That's with M. J. Elmore, who is from the Midwest, and she happened to be a girl who was good at math, and she makes it to Purdue, and then she comes out west and is going to work for a company called Intel, and she arrives, she drives out in this old rusted out Ford Pinto, and the floorboards are so rusted out, in fact, that she can see Sand Hill Road rushing by below. <laughs> True story, when she told me that, I was like, yes, as a writer, I, was, I love that. Um, I love her journey. It, then as she goes on and you know, adds on things in her life, um, I love the story of Magdalena Yashil coming from Istanbul, Turkey with $43 and nine gold bracelets to her name. Uh, one of the only women electrical engineers at Stanford and her path, she calls it kind of a bumper car career where she would bump against this wall and make a mistake and find her way back. Um, serial entrepreneur. Um, I love this story of how she was just filled with certitude when Mark Benioff told her his idea for Salesforce. And he asked her, uh, should I do it and can I do it? And she said, yes and yes, and I will help you raise money. Um, Teresa Gao who is a first-generation immigrant. Her parents came from Jakarta, Indonesia, for a better life. And she was raised in this blue-collar town. Her first job was flipping burgers at Burger King. Uh, she goes to Brown, magna cum laude, comes, to, comes west to Stanford, uh, gets her MBA, and goes on to a semi-failed startup goes to Excel, chases down some of the hottest deals in venture history, and is a co-founder of Aspect Ventures today, is fantastic. Sonia, um, I have many favorite stories about Sonia. <laughs> and one, since she is here, which kind of defines how these women, or encapsulates how these women succeeded, is Sonia was invited uh, by Tom Weissel, a very well-known name in investment banking, to a skiing boondoggle in Sun Valley. And she was a young associate at the time. She wasn't yet a partner. And so she went, and she's there in the lodge, and she's thinking, you know, it's après ski time, and she's happily, you know, sitting there. And up saunters Tom with his posse in tow, and he says, Sonia, I've signed you up. You're in the race. <laughs> And Sonia is looking, and Sonia has a great poker face, I've learned. But Sonia is in that moment, and these women all made these great decisions in these moments where they had to determine whether what they were going to do, and it had a big impact, but step by step on their future. Sonia could have declined, but she has this philosophy, you can't win if you don't play the game. And so she said, sure. That afternoon, she's up on these icy slopes, and it's, she's literally competing against former Olympic skiers and investment uh, and Navy SEALs, who Tom Weissel liked to recruit to turn into investment bankers. And she's there in her you know, puffy Patagonia jacket and, uh, l and looking down at this snowy precipice. And she described it feeling very much like the Grinch's dog, Max, looking over the snowy <laughs> precipice. <laughs> Certain this was not going to end well, but she did it. So she made it to the bottom, one step at a time. Obstacles are my allies. That's what she thinks, and that's kind of her mantra. And she made it to the bottom, thumbs up from Weissel and crew. But that night, she was seated to Weissel's right at the dinner table. So she got this coveted seat in the house. And there were so many decisions like that that these women, you all, Lori, you included, made that were to get in the game, to um, have thick skin when necessary, to know when to take issue with something and know when to let it go, to know when to use humor to diffuse a tense situation. So I have a million stories that I love like that, but that are also great takeaways, like, like the skiing story. Get in the game. And I right. love that you interviewed so many male venture capitalists as well, so you were able to really understand the industry to see 
how these stories were unique, and it really came through in the book. It, it read like someone who really understood the venture capital industry, so it was tremendous to read. Thank you. Um, so, um, Sonia, first, uh, I'm curious what you think you, you bring to the table in the boardroom that may be attributable to gender, and uh, in the book, you, it also said that after a board meeting, Andy Ori, who was uh, another gentleman you'd backed at Priority Call Management, Acme Packet, and 128 Technology Now, after the board meeting, you asked him how he felt about it. And women are taught not to be touchy-feely or overly emotional. So how do you ask someone how they feel and not be touchy-feely? Well, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I mean, I, so venture capital was my first job after college. And so I never knew anything different, right? And I, I, I loved the job. I thought it was so exciting talking to entrepreneurs and researching new markets. You know, I just, I just never really thought about my gender. And, um, and, and so I, I really don't know. I mean, I, I haven't really been to a lot of board meetings without being a woman. So it's, it's kind of <laughs> hard, <laughs> hard to tell. But but I do know that like I have it's unforgettable. Yes, yes. <laughs> but you know, by asking a CEO how he's feeling after the board meeting, it's a really smart business move because as Abe will know, you know, you can get beat up in a board meeting, especially when you didn't make the numbers, right? And so when you talk to the CEO the next day and you ask him how did he feel, or she, um, and they say, well, you know, I feel great. We, our pipeline is like very long and, you know, of course we missed this number, which you always did. Oh, of course, but around the corner, there's 17 more customers. Optimism. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then if the CEO tells you, you know, I, I don't know what I'm doing, you know, this, I've tried this and tried this, then you know, maybe this company's in trouble. And, you know, what you try to do before a company is really in trouble is you try to sell it before everybody else knows. <laughs> Right? <laughs> right? I mean, there's value there. So if you can see, you know, eight months down the road or a year down the road before you're running out of cash that maybe this company isn't going to make it, you, you want to find a home for it and you want to find a partner and maybe somebody's got a better distribution channel than you do. So you find a home for it. So, you know, in my industry, a lot of people, you know, they swing for the fences and they want 10 to 100 times their money. I am totally satisfied getting my money back or getting two times my money or three times my money if I think the company doesn't have the chance to be number one in its marketplace, right? But I think a lot of the guys that um, you know, I have seen in the, in the years that I've been a woman venture capitalist, <laughs> um, you know, they're too afraid to admit that their company might fail, and they wait till the very end when it's almost impossible to sell a company, and then the whole thing falls apart. And maybe you don't save the jobs, and you don't save the customers. And so I think I try to look ahead. I'm always thinking of situations, and you know, I always recommend to my companies that they always have a business development program, maybe not a person, but they're always talking to potential partners so that if for some reason the company does not succeed, you will f have an easy home for it you know, later. So maybe that's what being a woman in venture means. Yeah. And Abe, so how do you share bad news with the board? Because it's so much easier to just focus on the good things, <laughs> and you're an optimist anyway. So <laughs> how do you share that news, and how do you know how much to share with your board and how, to tr how much to trust them? Well, the, the, I've learned a lot over the last 20 some years of being a CEO. And th you have a lot of bad news to share with boards over that period of time. But <laughs> what I find is that um, it's kind of, it, it actually makes total sense and is logical. And you're going to say, why didn't I think of that? The reality is nobody wants to hear bad news. What they want to hear is what's happening and what are you going to do to fix it, right? If you, if, you, if you talk to a board and you have to share bad news, the bad news needs to be very short, and the things you're going to do to fix it needs to be the focus. Mm -hmm. And if you really you know, put your energy behind that, it actually becomes pretty easy to, to share bad news. The other thing I've learned is that, uh, and Sonia actually said this already, which is companies miss their numbers. It's normal. As a CEO, you're usually, you know, you're, you kind of get trained to think that you're the only one that ever missed your numbers. 
um, and that you're, you're going to have to share this with the board and investors are going to kill you because you missed your numbers. The reality is every company that they have has missed their numbers probably more times than you have. So again, it's really not about the bad news. It's about what you're going to do to fix it. And that's how you share bad news is talk about what you're going to do to fix it. Because that also shows that you're a pretty good CEO and you're focused on the right stuff. Um, so that's, that's been my experience. It took me a long time to learn it. But you can write that down, and that's your secret now. <laughs> <laughs> so Julian, you have profiled many powerful male titans in the industry. And uh, how was it in comparison writing about these women, and what did you learn on how women, in particular, in this industry succeed? And is it the same, or are there different tricks? Well, it's interesting because I had profiled these men who um, are now kind of these iconoclasts and who succeed by not compromising, not backing down, by uh, refusing to let go of some outsized dream. And then I started working on Alpha Girls and I learned really of how Women succeed in a very different way, particularly women in male-dominated industries, and there are far too many of those industries. Um, it's actually quite shocking when you start looking at the, at the numbers. But women, the women that I've profiled, and I think this is much more relatable to the rest of the world in terms of how we succeed, which is I concluded that you can increment your way to success that small victories add up to something really significant, um, and that resistance takes many forms, that you can fit in and you can advance yourself at the same time you are advancing causes that are important to you. And that's what I saw that was brilliant about how these women uh, were able to operate, going from navigating to trailblazing that they didn't start out as trailblazers. They didn't start out as pioneers. They started out, as I said, on this canvas with this kind of shared dream and nothing to back them up. And step by step, they made the right decisions. Um, and they got to this point in their careers where now they're successful enough uh, they have enough credibility where they can start rewriting the rules themselves. And that's a very powerful narrative journey to go on, a very difficult one, but a really profound one. Again, where I think it's relatable to how most of us can succeed or attempt to succeed. It's, it's again, one step at a time. Um, and then pulling others along with you. And then when you get to this place of success, like. Sonia got to a place where she wanted to make some changes, add on some things in her life that were missing. Women, a network of women, uh, help the next generation of women and girls and show what it, how dynamic this industry can be. So now she's a part of this, um, this powerful, nascent movement that is led by these women, but who succeeded one step at a time, and now they're trying to rewrite the rules uh, for, what's, for the next generation that's coming in. So it was a very different trajectory in terms of success, a very different model for success. And it really changed the way I think about how most of us uh, succeed and how it's possible. So try to fit in until you understand the system and then and then trailblaze and perhaps try to change some of the rules once you've established I think, yourself. I think so. I think there's a Trojan horse sort of analogy where you have to get your foot in the door and we all have to learn to navigate. Uh, you know, whether it was me starting my career as a journalist, uh, you have to learn the ropes you know, before you start uh, breaking any rules. And, uh, but, but there's a beauty to that and there's, a, there's power in that. So Sonia, what advice do you have to folks in the audience who are interested in perhaps pursuing a career in venture capital? Well, I uh, 
if you have a passion for venture capital, I highly recommend that you pursue it. Um, I think I'm the poster child for anybody can be a venture capitalist. Um, I started at TA Associates when I was 22 years old. I did not have an engineering degree, nor did I have any venture capital experience. Um, and somehow uh, made it uh, as a very successful venture capitalist. And, and the reason why, and I think this is what the best venture capitalists have, is they have a really good sense for markets and new markets and what um, has been unfulfilled in a market, right? Um, I think some of the worst venture capitalists, believe it or not, are the technologists because they get so excited about the technology, they forget to ask the question, um, are there any customers that want to buy this, right? I mean, that's like a really key question, right? Um, and so, so I would just say, you know, have a passion for new markets, and, and then you have to actually win the deal, right? Um, you know, I worked uh, in, as a salesperson in a department store. I was a, a, a per, I, I was on telesales, you know, cold calling, you know, all that kind of stuff. And you know, you really need to win the deal. That's how the best venture capitalists actually um, win. And if you're not a, a brand name, if you're just a young person trying out, you have to do a lot of things. And so I just think that sales is a really an important part of this job and working with people and all of that. So, um, and I would just say keep trying. I, after, after my job at TA, I had actually found three companies and all three went public. And you'd think, including McAfee Associates, and you'd think that that would be kind of a no-brainer to hire me for the next associate job. Um, and I could not get a job after Harvard Business School to save my life. I mean, it was so hard. And I even got a job offer with a private equity group. And I said, I don't want that. I want to be a venture capitalist. And so I end up just, I just kept going. And I turned things down that I didn't want. And I just stayed, stayed so focused on getting the job in venture. And I could have probably taken another job doing something else. But, but I was so passionate about getting in because it is really hard to get into this industry. But you know, once you're in, it's, it's awesome. So don't give up. <laughs> Wonderful. Well, we, uh, there is a tradition. Before we get to Q&A, and there are lots of good questions, uh, the Computer History Museum, uh, their Entrepreneurship Center, has a tradition of asking each of our distinguished speakers one word of advice for the audience. So I'm going to have you each. Uh, one by one, give us your word of advice. Uh, I know Sonia has Sonia has far more because you have the advice <laughs> for uh, <laughs> advice for girls. Um, and then we'll move to Q and A. So, uh, Sonia, please first? show us your word. Okay, the big reveal is connection, and it's about connection between your values and connection to your work. And I value honesty, I value hard work, and I value access for everyone. And I have been lucky enough to have invested in several entrepreneurs who share my same values, and that includes Abe Kleinfeld, Andy Ori, Anne Bonaparte, Miriam Nafisi, and Jeff Husey. And these entrepreneurs created companies that mattered, that made the world safer, that made the world more productive, and made us better connected. And so connection to me is living your values and working your values. That's very good. <laughs> yeah. So my word is forward, because I'm a big believer in focusing on what's in front of you, not what has happened already <laughs> or what's behind you. And I find that um, when you, I'm a big science fiction fan, and it's all about the future. <laughs> so the more you focus on the future, the more successful you're going to be. The less you worry about the past, the more successful you're going to be. So always look forward. <laughs> Mine is love. Uh, love what you do, and that's a commonality with those who I've interviewed who find success in whatever field. And I happen to love writing. 
I was a word geek as a kid, and I still am. And love, love what you do, and that will get you through those tough times, those nights when I'm up at 2 AM and my only companions are the raccoons peering in at me. Uh, when your job gets really hard and you love it, you're going to persevere. So love what you do, and it will get you to a really, really good place. OK, there's so many good questions to choose from. First one, as a husband, how do I best support my wife in her career? What are some things that I can do to help? Abe, you want to do must that? must be the only husband up here. <laughs> <laughs> Mostly, to be honest, is I just stay out of the way. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's really the, the smartest thing for me to do. But um, my wife and I actually met at work. And, um, and after we got married, she stopped working. So that, and the main reason for that was one stressful person in the family was probably enough. Um, and so, and I'm a big supporter of that. I really wanted her, I was very happy for her, and I've kind of lived her retirement through, um, you know, through that experience while I work you know, like crazy all the time. But I'm kind of built for it. I just, I tried to retire after my last job, and I, um, I did a terrible job at retiring. <laughs> I really need to be working. And she absolutely loves her life. And so I'm a big supporter of that, and I, I, and I, just, I just get out of the way. That's how I um, support her. <laughs> but okay. I think that oh. there's such an unequal distribution or division of labor for uh, working couples that that's one thing that comes out in the research and in is in the book, and that is um, there has to be more equality in the work that is at home because women still do far more uh, than men do. Women who are working full time have full time spouses. They're still doing. Um, way too much uh, of the work at home, which can hold you back. Here's That's a practical true. advice. Yeah. Yeah. Practical advice for, the, for anybody who's married, you just, it's all about the setup. You just figure out who does yeah. what. Like I never take out the trash because that's my husband's job, right? But I have to write every thank you note and every Christmas present has to get done by me. So we just have literally to the detail, like who, who, who empties the dishwasher? You know, he does it. Um, and, and we know who does what, and it just makes it so much easier. Okay. I do change the litter boxes. Okay. I'm responsible for that. <laughs> this, this is a good one that may take some thinking, but hopefully it'll be top of mind. What are lessons you've learned from the biggest mistake you made in your career that made you come to the successful place where you are today? I think my biggest mistakes we're not pounding the table hard enough in order to get deals that I really believed in done. Um, I was too worried maybe to have consensus. And you know, it turns out the best deals are the ones that are not, uh, that are the most controversial. Um, you know, because those are, those are the ones that have the biggest potential. And so I, I wish I had pounded the table a little bit harder and, and maybe used my voice a little bit more. And I obviously am doing more of that now. Yeah. Can I share a regret from the book? You may. OK. So this is for Magdalena. Um, when I think it's an important lesson and speaks to also the domestic responsibilities. Uh, when Salesforce was going public in 2005, I believe, um, she, Mark Benioff wanted her there. Uh, they were on the New York Stock Exchange, and her, one of her sons was sick, and so she opted to miss the IPO and stay home. And to this day, she can't remember which son was sick <laughs> or what it was, and she regrets that that was one occasion where she Never could have been that. there. So her message is, and this may be controversial to some, but it should not be, is that you don't always have to be there for your family. There are times when women need to choose these pri and prioritize things that are just for themselves. An IPO happens once. She had helped uh, start that company. and. You know, it's an important, important lesson. And she does joke, though, that she, 
I don't know which, which son was even homesick. <laughs> so. OK, I'm going to combine two of them. It's inspiring to hear about individual women who've made it, but what about structural or institutional factors that help or hinder women? And along with that, do we have ideas for how we can encourage more women to aspire to CEOs, senior positions, or venture capital positions? So I'm going to put those two together. Any ideas? Well, I think we discussed a lot, a lot of that, you know, where um, like hires like, and it's just harder to, to hire a, a more of a diverse person because it's just not comfortable, you know. Um, I think we've seen laws that have changed now in California. They're requiring to have more women on boards. And for the longest time, pe people, including myself, were against it because um, it just didn't seem that merit-based, um, but nothing changed for 30 years, right? And there's even a smaller percentage of women venture capitalists now than there were 30 years ago. And so I think there need to be structural changes where you know, limited partners need to stop investing in all-male venture capital funds, right? Um, you know, they need to measure uh, salaries and performance and, and percentages like some of the larger companies are doing, but actually get the data and, and see if there, there are biases. Um, and I think with more of those type of things that are probably not nearly as pleasant as doing the right thing or figuring it out for yourself, um, I think it will make change. It won't, not, it won't always be easy. But there is so much data that shows that diverse teams make better decisions. The decisions aren't always as easy to get to because um, you know, when you have differing opinions, you have a lot more debate. But once those decisions are made, they tend to be better. And so I think there's just a lot of things that can happen legally. It can happen from the limited partner space, and then also internally from HR systems and things like that. It's shocking, though, to me that we are where we are, that we're having this conversation uh, really not just in tech, but across, across industries where I've been talking to, whether it's home builders or whether it's architects or whether it's women in law or medicine or advertising. And you know, to have the representation at the senior level being in all of those industries between 5 and 20 percent is unacceptable and shocking and a call to action in my mind. You know, we have these great success stories and women can succeed and they do succeed and Alpha Girls tells those stories, but there are also these ridiculous barriers that still exist. And there's the affinity bias and the maternal bias and, um, you know, and the, and the pay gap. And so there are these things, you know, it's the, the, that are very real and very ongoing. That it's, it's shocking when you start looking at the numbers. And then there are these, you know, you look at Sonia's life and your life, and you love the industry. You love being in tech. You love venture capital. So it shows what's possible. Like, we have to get to there, you know? That and any ideas come to you from the book on, that are translatable to others that want to succeed in tech and in venture capital? Were there any key words of wisdom that you would share that came out of that to change it? Because one of the other questions was, in 20 or 30 years, will we still be talking about how male-dominated all these industries are? Or are there things that are changing or things that we can do now to make the change happen? Well, I think in the face of all of those kind of dire uh, statistics that I cited, um, we do have reason for optimism. And we have discussions like this. We have amazing women who you know, are founding um, venture firms uh, and funding, you know, women, uh, funding women founders at unprecedented rates. You know, Broadway Angels is at over 50% of its investments go to women founded firms. Aspect Ventures is around 46%. There are these pockets of hope and optimism and change, and there's all raise. And, uh, and there are wonderful men who are getting in on this discussion. It can't be a discussion that is by her, with her, for her. It has to be with everybody involved and sincere. And then if you don't think that it's a moral or ethical imperative, 
just the bottom line. More, as Sonia was saying, you know, the more diverse your company is, the more profitable your company is going to be. So, I think all of those, you know, idea, hopefully, will will gal keep this movement going. So there are reasons for optimism, but there are also reasons to be very eyes wide open. And one of the other questions uh, was to the two of us, you chose to serve on boards and take board and advisory roles instead of CEO roles. What motivated these choices? And one thing that I've seen is, at least in boards, it's, it's changing. And for me, board, being on a board allows you to have a lot more impact and deal with a lot of the existing power hierarchy and start having those conversations from a place where you're across the entire organization. And for me, I like to see connections between different functions. And so serving on the board, it allows me to uh, both hopefully learn a lot, ask a lot of good questions, and hopefully speak with some authority based on my experience. So boards, some of it because of the laws changing, as you talked about, and some of it with just a lot of discussion and recognition that's been going on from a lot of organizations talking about the lack of women on public company boards. I think you've seen a lot of movement there. What do you think on, on the boards? Yeah, well, I, I have zero operating experience, and I'm not very detail-oriented, so I would make a terrible CEO of a company. <laughs> so I'm a much bigger picture and strategist and, and all of that. So. Um, so my, my strength and my passion is just being on boards and seeing new companies and new markets. And, you know, it used to be software utilities were hot, you know, so that, like, I've really gone through a lot of different kinds of markets, which I really love. Wonderful. Uh, one other one. How do I join the Alpha Girl Club? What are the requirements to apply? <laughs> Everyone's an Alpha Girl, right? Uh, I like that. The real question. question is, how did I get in? Yeah. <laughs> we, we love having you as an honorary Alpha Girl. It's excellent. Okay, wonderful. Um, let me see if there is one more that I, that I haven't asked that's uh, interesting. Um, I guess the question that we also had in our earlier talk, talk, is there ethnic diversity that you're seeing in Alpha Girls, and if not, why? Well, you know, it's funny. I was, um, there's a story in Alpha Girls about a company, F5, which was shown to me by Kim Davis, now Kim Davis King. She is African American. She went to Stanford and Harvard. Um, her father was a first vice Af admiral in the Navy. Um, uh, an African-American gentleman. And, you know, she showed me this great deal. We did it together. We had, you know, it was an amazing ride. F5, I think, is worth about $10 million today. I'm not sure exactly. Um, but, but nobody even thought to take a picture of the two of us on the board, or the whole board. I mean, it was such a unique board with two women, one African-American and one, um, you know, white woman. And, and no one even thought to take a picture. And we didn't even notice. We weren't even thinking about that, right? And I think, I think the, this book uh, will showcase, you know, the, the, the diverse women, the, the few diverse women that we have. I, I know in Broadway Angels we have three African-American women, and, and these women, other women can see, and men too. And um, hopefully we'll kind of start the slow process, because we really need to get it going. Wonderful. Yeah. Um, I want to thank the panelists, and uh, I know that I want to leave time for everyone to get their books signed and to buy them for all of their friends and family <laughs> and everyone they've ever met to uh, change the tide. So I hope you brought enough books. And uh, I think Marguerite was going to come up uh, for a moment. So first, I want to thank all thank the you. panelists. Thank Julian, Abe, Sonia, and Lori, it's been a very memorable night of incredible stories and important insights on a, on a timely topic that concerns us all. So please join me in giving all of our speakers one last round of applause.